Yeah, let's see how this goes. I am responding to a video by the Marxist economist Richard Wolff, who is a pretty big philosopher king to the uh, bread tube and uh, left tube and commies, commie knuckleheads on, on YouTube and Twitter and whatnot. He's a big, uh, uh, from the Young Turks, they seem to really like him. What up, uh, Cladu? Anyway... Uh, he did this video that's titled, uh, Why Capitalism is Theft. Why Capitalism is Theft, uh, which is not too ridiculous a conclusion when you operate from the premise that production is force, which a lot of uh, Marxists, that's how they see the world. So let's check out, uh, let's check out Richard Wolff. Start this baby over. Makes use of some kinds of tools, equipment, raw material, whatever. For example, let's use a chair as an example. If you're going to make a chair, you need some wood and some glue and maybe some nails and a hammer, and you, you, you get the idea. All right, so Richard Wolff is using a, uh, the chair, a chair factory as an example for his, uh, for his example of why capitalism is theft. But for this video, for this rebuttal, I am going to use restaurants as a as an analogy, as an example, because I think restaurants, whether it's a franchise, whether it's a fast food franchise or whether it's family owned, I think the restaurant business is something that most people in today's world can easily grasp because a lot of people have either been customers of uh, restaurants. I think mo I think every American has or they have uh, and or they have worked in uh in restaurants so this is a much easier thing to grasp all of those things that are used in production were made by human beings labor that's now available for us to use to make more things somebody did work a while ago to make the hammer which i'm gonna now use to make the chair somebody a while ago put together whatever needed to make the glue that i use and to cut the trees into the lumber that i use and so we're going to use a simple EL, embodied labor. Every production makes use of embodied labor, labor that's embodied in some product that was done earlier that's now an input to what we're doing now. Basically simple idea. Now, I don't know if embodied labor is a bullshit term. Uh, I haven't really put much thought into it. It sounds like he's, he's using this term to create somewhat of a dichotomy between different types of labor. So... Using our restaurant example, embodied labor would be something, uh, would be the food that goes into, the ingredients that go into the dish. So say it's a Mexican restaurant. I once worked at a family-owned Mexican restaurant. The, uh, the embodied labor would be the avocados and all the peppers and spices that go into guacamole. It would be the, the tortillas that, uh, that help wrap the burrito. It would be uh, all of the, 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 the peppers and, and, and sauces that go into making salsa and everything. So it's all the food, and you can even apply this to the utensils in restaurants, cooking utensils and, and disposable uh, utensils like paper plates, napkins, plastic forks, plastic straws, which, are, uh, which people in California are trying to make illegal. But uh, that would be the embodied labor in a restaurant. You take the ingredients, food ingredients, and you make it into a delicious dish that people want to buy. Here comes another simple idea. With this embodied labor, labor embodied in all the tools, equipment, and raw material, production involves the addition of living labor, the worker, you, him, her, the people working. So we're going to call that living labor. So in our restaurant example, living labor would be the prep cooks, the line cooks, the cashiers, maybe uh, a custodial person, or maybe someone doubles as that. That would uh, the, uh, a delivery driver if uh, if the business if the restaurant is in the business of delivering food. So that would be the living labor. You get the embodied labor, the, all the food and the ingredients, and then the living labor takes those ingredients and makes it into delicious entrees. What a wonderful idea. Embodied labor plus living labor gives you the total labor in whatever we produce in an economy. It's real simple. Okay. 
Real simple. Richard Wolf makes uh, running a business sound real simple. And yet here he is uh, being a hack economist at a major university. You'd think with all he knows about running business, he'd be able to uh, start his own business and just crush it in the private sector. Yet I highly doubt he could uh, manage a McDonald's at a profit for longer than two weeks. You can say it in other words. There's the value of all the stuff we use up when we produce, tools, equipment, and raw materials. And then there's the value added by the worker who uses those pieces of equipment to transform the raw material into the final. So this is nails, glue, lumber. This is the chair maker's effort. And the outcome is the chair. Of course, someone had to conceive of the chair. Someone had to design the chair to make it look uh, fashionable as part of maybe a living room set or a dining room set to match the dining room table or whatever. Had to make sure the chair is comfortable. I mean, there's a variety of different chairs you can uh, buy for a variety of different purposes. Could just be a cheap piece uh, of plastic chair for your kid's uh tea party set or whatever it could be a nice comfy lazy boy recliner that you come in and relax in while you're watching football on sundays could be a stadium seat a movie theater seat that's just uh you know looks cool there's not not the most comfortable but yeah there are a variety of different chairs there will be a a, a demand for a variety of different chairs within a within an, an economy but uh, Richard wants to ignore that aspect of what uh, what might be appealing to the consumer: comfort, looks, sturdiness. Can it can uh, the chair withstand uh, someone who is heavier than two hundred pounds? In fact, uh, well, let's uh, let's talk about the movie The Patriot. Remember the beginning of the movie The Patriot, the movie about the American Revolution, starring Mel Gibson. He, uh, the movie begins with Mel Gibson making his own chair and he sits in it and it falls apart like he was in the middle of a uh, of an, uh, an America's Funniest Home Videos episode. But uh, yeah, it just goes to show you that uh, chairs, uh, the production of chairs was very primitive before American capitalism. This is very simple. What is capitalism about? Capitalism is about freeing the individual to uh, live his life as he sees fit to pursue happiness and whatnot, where government only protects the individual's right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of property and happiness. That's what capitalism is about. What you do with your freedom, that's completely up to you, Richard. By some process, which we can talk about later, the embodied labor, the work done by working people in the past, becomes the private property of a few people. You know their oh. names, they're called employers. They got their, they didn't make this stuff. Absolutely not. Somebody else did, workers. But those workers didn't get to keep what they produced. Why the fuck would they want to keep what they produced? Presumably they produced it so that they could sell it and make money. You know, if you're a farmer, if you're farming, say, avocados for my restaurant example, say, you know, you farm, uh, you know, tens of thousands of avocados a year, you're not going to eat all those fucking avocados, Richard. Obviously, you're going to sell most of those avocados uh, in exchange for money so that you can buy oranges and apples and, and meat. Uh, even non-food products like a chair or a car, maybe may, maybe to help pay off your mortgage, whatever. Why you don't need to keep all the products uh, of your labor? <laughs> they lost what they produced, and it became the property of somebody else. And that they lost what they produced. Uh, again, so like Nintendo. That, this is another example. Or Apple. Apple has th probably thousands of, uh, of iPhones in, in a given store, hundreds if not thousands. Now, do you think they want those phones or do you think they want uh, the customer's money more than those phones? It's what trade is all about, win-win. Capitalist. Oh no, Apple didn't get, the Apple workers didn't get to keep all of their iPhones. Brings to the production process 
whatever it is he owns. Let's just say, just to make it simple, that it's worth a hundred. It doesn't matter what it is. Just a hundred of anything. So we know we're using up in making chairs 100 worth of hammers, nails, glue, lumber, all of that. And now the worker adds value to what he or she produces by transforming the lumber, nails, and glue into a new finished thing called a chair or a sofa or any other piece of output. Okay, and let's just to make it real simple say it's another 100. And so the final chair is worth 200. I told you this would be easy. 100 plus 100 equals 200. Economists think this is an enormous achievement here, but most of you probably don't. The arithmetic is simple. Okay? Now let's follow the logic as Marx did. This is what a capitalist does. Again, this is, uh, this is a Marxist. And uh, this is uh, this is an economist, a thinker that many people on the left look up to. He brings a hundred of what he's come to acquire. But remember, everyone on the left, they just want whatever the fuck Denmark has. <laughs> Somehow, we don't know how. And by the way, we never asked the capitalist quite how he got it, do we? It's really only do you got it or do you not have it? And if you have it, you can be the employer. And if you don't, you can't. The fact that the employer who has it didn't produce it is a nagging problem we prefer not to ask. But we'll come back to it. So, yeah, and he's going to come back to it because you're going to see that he contradicts himself. So what he's implying here, what Richard Wolff is implying here, is that uh, the employer, the capitalist, just probably stole the embodied labor products, which is not true. Your business would not survive for very long if you're relying on the theft of other people's products. If, if, uh, if for a restaurant, if a restaurant owner is just stealing food from other farmers and those farmers aren't selling their food at a profit, eventually those farmers are going to lose their shirts and uh, someone's going to buy up that farm and start charging prices. So even if the, if the restaurant owner, the employer, got away with it, their business would not sustain for very long because uh, people need uh, money to survive. So what he's implying here is that every capitalist that, uh, that has acquired embodied labor, they must have stolen the embodied labor. And you know you can't be an employer because you don't have it. You didn't get it. Somebody else did. So, so yeah, did, did the, 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 those embodied laborers, did they just work for free, Richard? Were they just schemed out of it? Not to mention, yeah, if you want to open a business, uh, you can borrow money. You can, can borrow money to get your business off the ground. This happens all the fucking time on Shark Tank. This is why people come into the Shark Tank is to get investments, get money to help grow their business or save their business. In fact, there was uh, a recent episode where, uh, I, now I can't remember the name of the product. I think it was called Bang Sauce, Boom Sauce. I'll find it here in a second. But uh, he had a product that all the sharks liked. All the sharks were going crazy over it. But then uh, when it came to the business model, the, you know what the guy's issue was? He had a great product, he had sales, but uh, he did not have the means of production figured out because when the sharks asked him, well, how do we scale this? How, how do we scale this? He essentially said, if I'm recalling correctly, that uh, that I was actually looking for you guys to help me figure that out. I, I, you know, I, I know how to make this, uh, this sauce, this dipping sauce in slow cookers uh right now but i don't know how to scale make this uh scalable uh, efficiently so i was hoping you guys could help uh help me figure that out and the sharks were like we don't want to help you figure this out so he walked out without a deal the point of this tangent is that the means of production are not always that simple they uh they sometimes take a lot of figuring out i've used mcdonald's as an example it took uh, the mcdonald's brothers ray and mac took them uh, i think months to figure out how to uh how to get a workforce to assemble uh, hamburgers cheaply and efficiently. 
Same with Jimmy John's. I used to work at Jimmy John's. And I remember before I worked at Jimmy John's, you know, Jimmy John specializes in making uh, their, their submarine sandwiches freaky fast. Sub so fast you'll freak. And I always wondered, how the hell do they make their sandwiches so fast? Because sometimes you go into Jimmy John's, your sandwich is ready bef uh, before you even pay for it. While you're in the middle of ordering your sandwich, it will be done by the uh, before you even hand the, the cashier your money. And then when I work there, it's just like, oh, wow, this is really genius. What they do is they have a, a prep worker slice up all the meats, uh, carefully measuring each meat. I think it was like an ounce of meat per serving. And then they'd separate the meats with uh, with some type of uh, paper, some type of colony, uh, colony, colony, culinary paper. So one ounce of turkey paper, one ounce of turkey paper, and they just stack that up. Some prep worker would stack up all the meats, put in the prep stations, so then when it came time to make the, uh, the, the Jimmy John sandwich, someone would spread the mayo, take a few seconds, and then they'd hand it to the meat person. Then the, it'd only take a few seconds to slap on the meat. Boom, boom, boom. Pass the sandwich over to the next uh, line cook or whatever you want to call them. The, the living laborer. They'd put uh, maybe some peppers and, and salt or sauces on the sandwich and then wrap it up. Sandwich is made in less than a minute. But if uh, if you t if one person tried to make that sandwich in isolation, it would probably take them longer than ten minutes. They'd have to slice up the meat and then put the meat on, slice up another meat, uh, and, uh, open the the sauces separately and whatnot. So the point is, uh, figuring out the means of production is not uh, as simple as Richard Wolf likes you to think. Well, the capitalist brings his hundred. But he uses that up. That's the tools and equipment used up. So that hundred shows up in the chair as half of the 200 that chair is worth. And we know that the chair is worth 200 because in addition to the 100 of stuff used up, there was 100 more value added by the worker who worked to make the chair that's worth 200. So what Richard is really uh, butthurt about is the profit motive. He's essentially saying that you should not uh, trade for win-win, that, uh, that that it's somehow bad. That you know, when you go to a restaurant, you know, say you order. Um, let's go back to the Jimmy John's example. The the all the ingredients that goes into making a sandwich at Jimmy John's, it's probably just a couple dollars. Probably anywhere between two or three dollars just for the ingredients and even even the labor. It's probably worth uh, anywhere between two and three dollars between the bread and the meats and whatnot, how little meat they use. But why do you go to Jimmy John's? Why do you go to any restaurant? Again, it's for quality and convenience because uh, you would rather go to a restaurant. You'd rather pay someone else to make your food for you than sp spend the time at home gathering the, the all the embodied labor at the grocery store, cutting up your meats and making it at home. You're paying for the convenience. Now, says Marx. And you but what Richard Wolff doesn't like is he thinks that Jimmy John shouldn't make a profit off of you. Instead of, char instead of charging you five, six, or seven dollars for the sub the, the sandwich that you're paying for, he thinks you should pay wholesale price, two to three dollars, because that's what it's worth. I'm going to say it with me because you're going to understand this. Now, Marx says, let's see. For the capitalist, he wants to get back what he laid out, the hundred. He gave a hundred to the production process. So, when so right here, Richard Wolff contradicts himself because earlier he implied that the capitalist obtained the body, the embodied labor by probably stealing it, by probably scheming it. We don't know how he got it. He just got it and you didn't. And then he got to be the employer. But we don't want to ask how he got it. Well, now he admits that the employer eventually has to replace that embodied labor by paying for the embodied labor. And that's how it uh, works in restaurants. Now, you could probably say the, the bigger corporate fast food chains, I, I think McDonald's probably owns their own supply chains. But the family Mexican restaurant I worked at, they were constantly uh, switching suppliers depending on price and other, uh, other agreements, other, uh, other reasons. But uh, the, the family restaurant, it's not like they own f avocado farms where they picked avocados and brought them into the restaurant to make 
guacamole with. It's not like they had chicken and cattle farms to make the steak and make the ground beef and make the chicken and make the pork that they used in their meats. No, they would order the meats from uh, from uh, from what from a meat supplier or a butcher or whatever. They'd order the tortillas from a local grocery store, order avocados from a variety of places, order utensils from a utensil maker and whatnot. And they had to pay for that stuff. Someone was making that uh, that embodied labor at a profit, and then the restaurant would take that embodied labor and make it into something more valuable at a profit. Ooh, not profits, you guys. <laughs> Anything but the profit motive. But again, Richard Wolff, he, on one hand, he wants you to think that employers, they get their embodied labor by, by stealing or by probably some sort of trickery. We don't know how they got it. But now he's admitting that they have to replace it by paying for it with money. When he sells the chair at 200, he's going to take 100 of it to replace the tools and equipment and raw materials used up in producing the chair. That's how he can keep on being a chair capitalist. That's how he can keep production going. He has to replace the tools, equipment, and raw materials he used up, doesn't he? Yeah, he does. Yes, exactly. That's how business works, Richard. You got to you gotta pay for the materials and then turn that ma those materials into something that people want to buy. I don't have the time to be Socratic because we don't have enough time. Okay, let's see. So out of the 200 worth of chair, you need to take 100 to replace what you used up. That leaves you with 100 after you sell the chair. What are you gonna do with the 100? You could, here we go now, because this is the crucial part. You could take the other 100 and you could give it to the worker. Because after all, it was the worker whose labor added the 100 of value to this stuff to make the 200. You could, couldn't you? Yeah, their labor sure did add value, and they presumably agreed to a certain wage on which to uh, exchange their labor for money. Again, what's the big deal here? Would, would these chair, uh, would these workers in the chair factory, would they otherwise be able to produce chairs more efficiently, thereby uh, making more money? The logic would be, gee, the worker added the value he or she, here we go, folks, should get it because he gave it. He created it. Now, did he create the, the whole chair or was he just part of the chair production process? If, let's, let's pivot back to the restaurant example. When, uh, when, when a burrito is made at, at the Mexican restaurant, you had prep workers preparing the, the variety of meats and the salsas and the guacamole to go on the line. But then, but they never assembled the actual burrito because we don't know who's going to order what. And so when someone comes in and orders the burrito, then it's the line cook that puts the burrito together and assembles it. And yeah, I think uh, assembling a burrito is actually a talent because I still don't know how to wrap my own burrito. I don't know how they do it at Chipotle, but they do a pretty good job. But uh, yeah, the, the, the labor is divided. So it's not like one worker made all of the chicken and made all of the guacamole, made all of the salsa and made all of the rice and all of the beans and all of the peppers, the fajita, the fajita peppers and the cheese, and then, and then assembled it into a burrito and then sold it. No, it's that labor was probably divided. And just like embodied labor, like he was talking about nails and stuff in a chair, or we can talk about peppers in a burrito or onions in a burrito. Does anyone ever, very few people will eat onions in isolation, like an apple. And I'm sure there are, there's probably a few people, actually, shut up. Uh, so usually onions are an ingredient, part of a bigger whole. And so onion, an onion in of itself isn't worth that much, but if it's, if it's part of a bigger dish, like a fajita or a, an, an enchilada or a burrito or nachos, then it becomes more valuable. And it's just like, work, yeah, workers, uh, they contribute in his dumb chair example, they contribute to the value of the chair, but it's not like one worker made the chair. And if they did, they should open up their own business where they make every chair one by one uh, or figure out a better way of making chairs and start their own chair factory. He made it happen. He should get it. 
Do you think that happens in capitalism? No, you don't, do you? We don't give the worker. Another example of embodied labor and why uh, the finished product is more worth more than the sum of its parts, I think a classic example of this is uh, is pen and paper. Go to go to any CVS, Walgreens, Target, Walmart. You you can usually find a ream of paper and, and some pens with ink. You can probably get both for under ten bucks, probably around five bucks, anywhere between five and ten bucks. You can get a ream of paper and some pens, and bring them home, and you can let them sit on your desk, and they won't grow in value. It's just pen and paper. You can get it uh, pretty much anywhere, but if you take the pen and paper, the embodied labor, and you turn it, you use your living labor, your mind and your wrist, your hand, to write a, 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 a compelling novel like Harry Potter or Atlas Shrugged or 1984 or Goosebumps or, or The Green Mile or It or any of other uh, Stephen King's novels. If you turn that into a compelling novel, well, now, now there's demand. When you go out and buy a, a novel, a book to read, like Goosebumps, Babysitter's Club, Stephen King, Ayn Rand, Harry Potter, you're not buying the, the book for the, the ink and the paper. You're buying the book for the compelling story. But Richard Wolff would, uh, would like you to think, well, it's just pen and paper. Who cares? He wants you to ignore the mental productive effort that it went into writing that book. Oh, it's just pen and paper and whatever your labor was. How dare you, uh, how dare JK Rowling make billions of dollars off of selling Harry Potter novels? The value. Added. Right, Richard? Added. Ever in capitalism. It's not how it works. You all know that. But I'm putting it kind of right up front and bold for you to deal with. What is it that capitalists do? They divide that hundred into two parts. One part is what we pay the worker. I'll be generous and say 50. Mm. And as, a, as, a, as Euron Brook has pointed out multiple times, a lot of businesses don't turn a profit for, for years. And this is a, an ongoing issue with Uber. Uber loses hundreds of millions of dollars every quarter because they are using borrowed money to essentially uh, pay their drivers. Uh, pay their drivers to uh, drive around. And yeah, the drivers agree to a certain rate. And all Uber is, they're not really an employer. They, are, they just create an app that connects drivers with people who need rides. Of course, they have some screening processes. Hey, does your car work? They, they, they have some standards uh, to becoming a, a driver for Uber. But yeah, uh, the, the Uber driver doesn't suddenly get to you know dictate his rates uh, or else all hell would break loose. It'd be total chaos. Who knows, uh, who knows what rate you're going to be paying uh, uh, depending on the driver. So Uber, they, met, they, they say, hey, you're going to get paid this much to drive this person to this place. You can either take it or leave it. But uh, the Uber drivers are right now, they're getting paid before the investors are, before the owners of the company are getting paid because Uber is uh, just burning through cash right now. Mm, no. Just, the, the, it's, I'm just trying to illustrate that Richard Wolf is full of shit here. Oh, you get it. If you made a chair of 200 and you used 100 to replace the tools, equipment, and raw materials you used up, and you used another 50 to pay the workers, that leaves what? 50. Good. Higher math of economics. 50. And Marx called this the surplus. It's what the capitalist has left over after he pays out to himself the hundred worth of tools, equipment, and raw materials. And what happens if he loses money, Richard? What then? He contributed that got used up, and he pays the workers. He's got to pay the workers, because if he doesn't, they won't show up anymore, and the game is over. So to keep it going, he has to replace the tools and equipment, and he has to pay the workers. But he has to pay the workers. Here we go, folks less than the value added by the workers when they work. Or to use the technical term economists like, he has to rip the workers off. 
rip the workers off. Well, if the workers are getting ripped off, they can demand higher wages or they can go work elsewhere. And yeah, this is a, this is a principle of free trade. It's win-win. Going back to my Apple example or even my Nintendo example, I didn't really go into the Nintendo example, but uh, yeah, when uh, when I send three hundred dollars to Nintendo in Japan in exchange for a Nintendo Switch, yeah, there it's win-win. The the Nintendo Switch, okay, Nintendo is probably a bad example because from what I've heard. Uh, hardware companies actually lose money on the hardware. It's somewhat of a loss leader. They make most of their money on the software. I don't know if that's still true or if it even was true to begin with. But, uh, yeah. So they use, uh, so let's use software as an example. That's where Nintendo makes their money. I send $60 to Nintendo in exchange for a an SD card that has Super Mario Maker 2 on it. One of my favorite games. $60. Now you could say, well, all of the stuff that went into making Super Mario Maker, it, uh, you know, b between the programmers, the designers, the, the chip manufacturers, the, the box manufacturers, the, 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 the designers, the artists. I mean, each cartridge is probably worth only between 25 and 40 bucks. So it's bad that I pay 60 bucks for it. But here's where the rubber meets the road is I would rather have Super Mario Maker 2 for the Nintendo Switch, then I'd rather have $60. Mario Maker 2 is worth more than, to me than the $60 is. So I don't really give a shit. I'm just thankful that Nintendo took a risk by paying a variety of uh, software engineers and artists and, and manufacturers and whatnot to deliver me a game that I love that I'm going to spend hours, if not days of my life playing in exchange for what $60 but Richard Wolf would hate that because he thinks I'm getting ripped off because the real production uh if you're just measuring uh pure production the disc is probably only worth 25 to 40 dollars he has to steal from them part of what their labor added same with the the novel example I got to use these examples I really got to hammer this home you you look at a Look at a, a print of a Harry a Harry Potter book. Probably cost pennies to make. Uh, between printing the paper on ink and, and, and binding it, probably cost maybe a, a buck or two. It probably retails for over ten bucks. I guess the customers are getting ripped off, aren't they, Richard? Even though they they line up in droves to buy Harry Potter books whenever there's a new one. You know what the lesson here is. For the that you're full of shit. Those of you who imagine that when you graduate from here, you will get a job. In fact, the only job you will accept is one that pays you what you're worth. Uh, never gonna happen. The condition. It's like what uh, what Jalen Rose, the basketball player, Jalen Rose says: "You're only worth as much as you're able to negotiate for." And I think he's right. Of your employment is that you produce more by your labor than you get paid. Welcome to the capitalist system. That's how it works. This thing, surplus, that's profits. Yeah, they make money and your life is probably easier uh, with some captain of, of industry uh, offering you employment opportunities as a consequence of their business model. Uh, because not everyone needs to work nine to, uh, not everyone needs to own their own business. And that's not always desirable. Running your own business is a pain in the ass. You're always on call. Uh, the, the Mexican restaurant example. Yeah, my boss was making lots of money. Uh, but uh, if, if a manager ever quits on the spot, which did happen, he had to drop whatever he was doing. If he was enjoying a beer with his friends, if he was at a baseball game, if he was at a concert, if he was spending time with his kids and a manager quit, guess who has to come in and, and fill in uh, and, and, and close out the restaurant for the evening? It's the owner. It's the employer. And yeah, running a business can be a pain in the ass. And sometimes it might be more desirable just to work for someone else while they profit off of your labor. Because what else would you be doing with your time otherwise? That's where the profits of enterprise come from.
the best way to describe your work in a capitalist enterprise is not that the employer gives you a job, it's that you give your employer the surplus. It's a win-win, Richard. The giver and the getter are in reverse order. And again, you can apply this to the consumer business relationship. When I go to Chipotle, I can I can make my own burrito bowls in my own house. It takes me an hour to make the guacamole by cutting up the avocados and the peppers and the onions and, and mixing all those ingredients together. Uh, for the meat, uh, throw it in a slow cooker. It probably takes four to six hours. Uh, cooking the beans, I usually half-ass the beans at home. I usually just order a can, but I know... Uh, the Mexican restaurant I worked at, I'm guessing Chipotle makes their beans in-house, which is more time-consuming. You know, but if I go to Chipotle, if I just, uh, if I if I decide, you know, I don't really feel like spending a few hours making my own burrito bowl. I'd rather just shell out a few extra dollars and uh, pay someone else to make a burrito bowl for me. I can just go to Chipotle and have a burrito bowl in under five minutes instead of waiting hours and doing my own work. But the, the fact that I am paying more money when I could be saving more money, that's an outrage to Richard. I'm getting ripped off. From what the language suggests. All right. And, uh, all right, any questions? Wish I would have pres uh, planned some sort of good zing or a line to uh, end this reaction. Anyway, so I did. That was my live first live rebuttal, and we'll see how this goes. <laughs>